You know, one of those folks who came to the retreat in America recently is a gentleman by the name of Edwards. And uh, he has carried a wooden cross trudging and walking along in many places, including some parts of India where I expected that he would have been stoned and the cross burned. But on the contrary, from his report, people rallied round and began to follow him. It's amazing. You know, when we can, there was a young man who was repenting and God showed him this. God's voice spoke to him. Carry the cross when you're young. And when you're old, the cross will carry you. You know, folks, many people today are ashamed to carry the cross. And we have been singing, ye soldiers of the cross, stand up. Now, before we go to a season of prayer, I want to bring you to Second Kings and the second chapter. Now, there is, to, one cannot read about Elijah without noticing that he followed the Lord as a rich young man. You see, we just heard of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and the Bible says he was rich. And here, you know, I have seen many people plowing their fields with cattle. Big, huge bulls. <laughs> you know, bulls that are taller than me, you know. Huge bulls. And, uh, but here was Elijah with 12 yoke of oxen. First Kings 19 and 19 verse. Now the Lord had asked, told Elijah that he was to anoint Elijah in his room. God was going to take away the prophet Elijah. You know, there have been great men in this country, wonderful men. Martin Henry was one of those great men. I believe he was an outstanding scholar in Oxford. And he went to India. And he would gather some of the beggars and give them all a tiny penny, a copper, and preach the word of God to them. Well, they would sit and listen. And those were the days when England ruled the country. So, and he was a British chaplain. 
and of great and mighty that sat in the cathedrals could not stomach his preaching. But nevertheless, he spoke the truth. And then what happened was someone said to him, hey, what are you wasting your time speaking to these beggars? And he replied, the soul of one man here is equal to the soul of the king of England. You know, we don't worry about what is happening around us. We are not concerned. Let Britain sink and die. We are not even prepared to be the mourners at the funeral of Britain. I don't know, how, how can you ever claim to be a Christian that way? God has no pleasure in the death of the sinner. And we are going to take, find great pleasure in seeing a great nation die morally, spiritually, and also physically. You know, dear friends, I find that this homosexual thing is a kind of bluff and intimidation. Hey, this is our lifestyle. God made them male and female. That's it. That settles it. There is no gender between. You know, you have the crossover vehicles. Oh, you say this is a beautiful vehicle. What is it? It's a crossover from a um, a car and a big van put together. But there is no crossover possible. And instead of obeying the word of God and seeing that it is good for us to do so, all oh, the diseases that are being generated by this immoral living of today, we will never come abreast. You know, in our medical services, we will never be able to come abreast, even financially. So what are nations doing, trying to do? Put all the pension money into Medicare or the welfare state. And a man is told your pensions have disappeared. The poor fellow was expecting to retire and get a pension and the pension has evaporated. What? just because of loose and immoral living. And then the whole nation goes into horrible debt. You know, people are wondering, where shall I store my money? A big question, you know. Where can I store my money? Eventually, they say the best place is under my pillow. <laughs> At least it stays there. If I put it in a bank, the bank gives me 
2% and in some places half a percent. All right. And the inflation, so you put a thousand pounds in a bank and it's going to give you half a percent. So you're going to get 10 pounds half it, five pounds at the end of the year. And the value of the pound has gone down by 10%. What is the net result? You have lost nine and a half percent of your money. Why? The nation has lost its Moorings. So it is senseless trying to put your money in a fixed deposit, as it was called, because you're going to lose heavily. And so people are wondering, what about the euro? Euro is safer? <laughs> no, of course not. You know, 17 disparate countries, different countries, different culture, different values, and, uh, and different work ethic. So, go ahead, you produce while I sit back in my lounge chair. So, you foot my bills. You see, you're affluent, you've got money. Folks, are we not going to see people like Elijah? And Elijah passed by and mark you, Elijah didn't speak a word to Elijah. And Elijah, 19th verse, 1 Kings 19, 19. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. That's it. Elijah's mantle gave him an inspiration, a direction. Now, we, don't we have any such mantle around? When people feel called by God, he immediately ran, he left the oxen. You know, when you are plowing a field, you can't generally leave the plow with the oxen so readily or abruptly. 20, well, he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. You know, he was later called the man who poured water on the hands of Elijah. He was going to be a servant. And uh, you know, a fellow said to me right here, a young man said to me, I can't remember which country he came from. However, he said, I gave a thousand pounds to a woman we turned up at the registry and we spoke our vows and she walked away and I walked away. Never seen her since. Why? He wanted to gain residency in Britain. 
He would sell his soul. Why? To climb to a, just to climb. But here was Elijah, a wealthy farmer. And what was he going to do? He was going to follow Elijah the prophet. And was Elijah a man with a palace? But did he have any luxuries to speak of? No. He had one thing only in life. What was it? To glorify God. You know, there are so many cheats today in Britain. My dear friends, you, do you know the London where I preached first, back before many of you were born, in 1958? You could not lose anything. If you left something on a train station, in some place in a train station, it would just be there. Or it would be in the lost and found. You couldn't lose a thing. You know, as I was standing one day on Oxford Street, to my great shock, I found one of those security guards coming and grabbing one of these women with a long black robe. and dragging her inside. Why shoplifting? Shoplifting. You know, when you discard the Ten Commandments, you become a bunch of robbers, cheats and robbers. Thou shalt not steal is gone. Thou shalt not commit adultery is gone. So, some of the cities today are becoming bankrupt. You know how? Really bankrupt. Why? Too many unwed mothers. And the city has to dole out money. And then it says, we are bankrupt. We must cut down the firemen, cut down the police department. We must cut this, cut that. And still we can't make it. Folks, you take, you meddle with the Ten Commandments, you have destroyed a nation. And here we see Elijah taking up the responsibility of a man like Elijah. Why? You know, the light which God gives us, the call of Jesus, must make us very humble. You know, folks, my grandfather was an idolater. But I know nothing about idolatry in the sense that never did I bow to an idol. And I never subscribed to any of that culture. None of that oppression of the old idolatry that belonged to my forebears. 
You see, my dear friends, we have got today a society which is really adrift. And I am amazed. You know, we used to think of the irresponsibility in the slums when the courts, the the topmost echelons of a country have become slummy morally. What have you got? Lawmakers who are breakers of the law. Lawmakers who have a criminal record. Oh, how sad. You know, what is the church doing? Dumb as a mummy in the coffin. No conviction of sin. So, my dear friends, what when Elijah was called to this, we see the condition of his servant. Elijah had a servant, you know, and his name was Gehazi. What a difference between the kind of servant that Elijah was. You know, when Elijah was parting with Elijah, first, Elijah wanted to be alone. You know, people feel very lonely. They had a chorus. Teenager, are you lonely? <laughs> when I first saw that uh, or heard that chorus, I said, this is strange. And then as I began to preach in Europe and America, I found many people saying, I'm lonely. And what does the Bible say? I'm never alone. Never alone. The presence of Jesus. You know, my dear friends, yesterday my wife spoke to you. She did not tell you, however, that I used to be away two months, three months, four months. Right from the time that she was practically a young bride. But there was no fighting amongst us. There were no arguments. There was no violence. There were never hard words. How can there be such contradictions? No. No. When Elijah was parting with Elijah. Three times he begged him, leave me alone. Well, he knew that God was going to catch him up. And uh, he wanted to be alone. Eventually, before the chariots of God came for Elijah, he said to Elijah, but what do you want now, young man? What do you want? You ask a young man what he wants, I want to be a millionaire. I want to drive that Porsche. I want to get the biggest Jaguar. Beware of covetousness. 
let us bring this old nature, this covetous nature, Gehazi's nature, to the cross. There is deliverance there. Let's pray. Holy Father, we know that there is no other place from which where we can gain freedom from a lying tongue. That nature which is in us to cheat, to pretend to dissemble, Oh, please give to us the nature of our Lord Jesus, that his being, that we may be partakers of his nature, divine nature. Please, Lord, wash us in your blood. We want to be free if the Son doth set you free, you're free indeed. Please, Lord, hear our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.